apparently either unsatisfied with what he's already been able to achieve as part of the conservative supermajority or just looking for things to meddle in. Clarence Thomas has a new goal, okay? He stripped away women's rights, he stripped away protections against a tyrannical president, and now he wants to get rid of OSHA. You know, like the organization that protects you on the job. You'll have a little poster up at your job and it's like, hey, here are the things they can't do that might injure or kill you. He wants to get rid of that. Now, it's not totally up to him. And as of right now, the Supreme Court announced which cases they're going to be taking up like for their next set. And one that they rejected was a case that fundamentally challenged the authority of OSHA to exist at all. So they are not taking that up yet, but Thomas was not happy about this. The case is all states refractory con contractors versus Julie A. Sue, acting secretary of labor. It was supported by conservative business groups and Republican attorneys general who wanna limit OSHA's power over the American workplace. So in his, in the case, the plaintiffs, Ohio based general contractors argue that Congress violated the constitution by delegating legislative power to an outside agency when it established OSHA back in 1970. Those 1970s era rights and organizations, it's very popular to get rid of those these days. So here's what Clarence Thomas said. Congress purported to empower an administrative agency to impose whatever workplace safety standards it deems appropriate. That power extends to virtually every business in the United States. The agency claims authority to regulate everything from a power lawnmower's design to the level of contact between trainers and whales at SeaWorld. He argues that if OSHA does not unconstitutionally grant too much legislative power to an agency, it is hard to imagine what would. It would be no less objectionable if Congress gave the Internal Revenue Service authority to impose any tax on a particular person that it deems appropriate. That is an insane comparison, but it's Clarence Thomas. He can do whatever he wants right now. He doesn't care about what you or I say. Now to be clear, if you're not really familiar with OSHA or what the situation was like before OSHA, worker deaths in America, Right now, it's about 15 a day in 2022, which, pause for a second, sounds too high. That sounds like a lot. Well, it was higher back in 1970 before OSHA, it was 38 worker deaths a day. Bear in mind, we have a significantly larger population in the United States than we did. And yet the number of deaths of workers per day is less than half what it was before OSHA. Worker injuries and illnesses are down from about 10.9 incidents per 100 workers back in the early 70s to 2.7 per 100 in 2022. So. Clearly, it seems to be working. It's not that OSHA is the only change between then and now, but we do have these protections for a reason. They protect regular working Americans. And if it were up to Clarence Thomas, it's likely that that would be gone. Sharon, what do you what do you make of the, the possibility that a case like this could be taken up in, in the future? It's very possible. Okay. I mean, look, they're not he's not even trying to pretend that he knows the law, cares about the law. They have a pact, he has to make good on the things that he was gifted from these donors, quid pro quo. And so this is going to keep getting worse. He's not gonna ever recuse. This is an activist, this is an extremist court. People have been correcting me in recent days. And you can keep seeing that it's gonna be more and more extreme and there will be no more pleasantries, there will be no RBG and her old friend going out for lunches and things. This is the mm -hmm. war. I was already in a bad enough mood. You reminded me of RGB. Um, but anyway, yeah, no, you're right. And and look, he, the court itself was not as emboldened as him to destroy this. Again, they're not picking it up yet, but he was. And look, I just want to say, I I find it very interesting the sort of decisions they've been putting out recently. But what it says about what they think about the executive branch, that you should have a president who can do literally anything he wants. He can walk into your house, he can put a shotgun to your family's head and pull the trigger and he might be fine. He can do whatever he wants. The agencies that report to him cannot do literally anything. And I think, I, I don't think that that is nonsensical from their point of view. They think that the president they're empowering to be a king will be a certain sort of person in the future. He will not be a king who will be willing to just unilaterally do a bunch of stuff to protect Americans. He will be likely a guy who's not interested in that stuff. The agencies 
do typically protect Americans though, and that's why they want them to be powerless. They want a strong executive and they want even stronger corporations. And corporations have traditionally been bound most effectively by the administrative state. And that is why they're moving to create a king at the same time that they've created corporations that are about as unbounded by the law as he is. And look, I can complain about this as like a lib or whatever that doesn't want people to be like needlessly thrown into like chicken processing machines or whatever. But I will say if you're a conservative and you're watching this, I know that you believe on some level that your movement is anti-elite, anti-establishment. Does it seem like the Supreme Court is on your side? Because these protections protect you from the corporation that you work for. And they don't want you to be protected in that way. They want the corporations to have more power. They want the billionaire future president to have more power. Why is it that your anti-elite movement produces Supreme Court decisions that only provide gains for the elites? Meanwhile, by the way, if you ever end up unhoused, you literally can't even sleep on the ground. They've outlawed that. Yeah, in limited areas right now, and that'll spread over time. So those with the absolute least have no power, they have nothing. Those who already have the most, they're like try, they're tripping over themselves trying to find something else that they can give to these people. And they brand that exercise anti-elite, populist. It makes no sense to me. I don't know why it makes sense to right wingers. I also wanna point out by the way, an example of this. So a, a sort of regulation to protect workers. And it's a tale of two states. So California where I live and Florida on the opposite end of the country. Both states that are hot and getting hotter, okay? But they're approaching the danger that heat provides to their workers in very different ways. So in California, employers will soon have to provide water and air conditioned areas for workers when temperatures inside warehouses rise above 82 degrees. When it goes above 87 degrees, they'll get shorter shifts and personal cooling fans, you know, so they don't die. Uh, meanwhile, in Florida, when a 95 degree sun bears down on farm workers, local governments are actually prohibited from making employers supply water or a break in the shade. So Florida basically said, we don't want any local area of Florida giving a damn about their workers. We're going to bar you preemptively from protecting them. So as it gets hotter, which it is, and it's going to every year from here on out, and more and more workers either fall sick or drop dead, you cannot do anything to protect them legally. And if you, again, if you're a conservative, a regular working conservative, which state do you think cares more about whether you live or die? Ron DeSantis is the dude who made this happen. There will be workers who will die on the job as a result of this. And I just wonder at like the next debate, you know, they talk about like migrant crime, any migrant who kills anyone's on Biden. Okay, well then why are Democrats not pointing out this? Why are they not using this in the same exact way? So look, I, I think the pattern Sharon here is very clear in what the Supreme Court is attempting to do and who is benefiting. What do you make of, of all these issues, including yeah. the heat? They've been lobbied and there are scores of Americans every year who have who amputees they become because of on the job conditions, deaths, bridges collapsing, a lot of other things, oil spills and the like. And once they are incapacitated and can no longer do the job, it'll be like the NFL treats a running back who turns 30. The contract mm -hmm. is cut, it's not guaranteed, can't help you, better start begging. Yeah. Oh, and by the way, you're right, you can't do that either. And you better have a place to sleep or else you're a criminal. Yeah, yeah, I don't know, get a boat, I guess go off the coast. Maybe at so, some point you'll be able yeah. to sleep there, I guess. Maybe. Um, by the way, someone asked a question. I'm not sure if I'm gonna be, Oh, uh, Angelica says, doesn't voiding Chevron already destroy OSHA? I think that's a very good question. It doesn't automatically, look, I'm not a lawyer, obviously. It doesn't automatically destroy OSHA. It makes it likely that over time, more and more of what OSHA has done will be overridden. It allows, even if it was done back in 1970 or 1980 or whatever, but it doesn't automatically mean that it's destroyed. Um, by the way, also, I love how insidious they are. Like the Supreme Court's done a lot of bad stuff, but hey, they've done some good stuff too, right? We have to be fair, we have to be unbiased. Didn't they allow medication abortion uh, to continue? Yeah, but they also destroyed the Chevron deference doctrine. So now the ability of places like the FDA to decide that it is safe can be challenged. So they can kill medication abortion without killing medication abortion. 
I'm not saying that that's necessarily gonna happen, but I'm saying that it does make it significantly more likely that that happens.